The SFC announces measures to strengthen information dissemination regarding virtual asset exchange platforms. Investigations continue into the death of two pipeline workers at an underground site in West Kowloon. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The Securities and Futures Commission will strengthen information dissemination and investor education regarding virtual asset exchange platforms. This comes as investigations continue into alleged fraudulent activities involving unlicensed cryptocurrency trading platform JPEX. Mimo Singai reports. Over 2,300 investors have reported to the police as victims since investigations into JPEX began, involving over $1.4 billion. Amid the ongoing scandal of the cryptocurrency exchange platform, the Securities and Futures Commission, or SFC, has decided to publish a list of licensed, deemed licensed, closing down an application pending virtual asset trading platforms to improve public awareness and understanding of the VATB industry in the city. Just last week, the SFC refused to make such a move. Speaking to the press today, the watchdog said the U-turn was due to public demand. The use of this list is only to check whether um, virtual asset trading platforms out there are misrepresenting their licensing status. Being on the list does not mean that the, um, the applicant actually can comply with the SFC's requirements and also that um, they remain unregulated and unlicensed until we process and actually approve their application. The watchdog also said it would collaborate with the police to establish a channel to share information on suspicious activities of VATPs. Meanwhile, the SFC also reminds investors to be cautious. As we said, fraud is difficult to uh, detect beforehand. And so investors are, uh, do have to be a very alert to um, fraudulent activities. The SFC added it will jointly hold a public education campaign with the Investor and Financial Education Council to further enhance awareness of fraudulent activities. Memos 9, TVB News. Investigations are underway after two pipeline workers died, apparently due to the inhalation of toxic gases at an underground site near the Elements Shopping Mall in West Kowloon. Sources say the Labor Department considers the site as a confined space. Authorities say, so far, there is no evidence showing the contractors had strictly followed relevant regulations. Sharon Tang has more. Police officers from the Yao Chim Mong Regional Crime Unit carried out investigations at the site in question at noon today. They also talked to technical staff at the work site. Later in the day, they brought two staff members of the contractor to the site for further investigation. This comes after two repair workers who were replacing pipes for the air conditioning system of the Elements shopping mall on Saturday were suspected to have been trapped underground the entire night. But the incident only came to light yesterday morning after family members couldn't reach one of the victims and was unable to get in touch with their employer overnight. Firefighters finally located the two men at the work site in the morning. They were certified dead in hospital. The two were suspected of inhaling toxic gases at the underground site. Sources say, according to statements taken from two staff members, no one was found working at the site at around 4 p.m. Saturday. It was later discovered that the gate at one of the exits was locked. Authorities are said to have determined the area as a confined space. Current laws clearly stipulate that for work within confined space, a thorough risk assessment by eligible people beforehand is required. <laughs> Chief Secretary for Administration Eric Chan said today that the authorities will make prosecutions if there is evidence of violations of rules and vows to carry out a thorough investigation into whether human errors or negligence are involved. So far, there is no evidence that shows the contractors had strictly followed relevant regulations. Fatal accidents have happened in confined space in the past. In 2021, two workers died after inhaling a toxic gas and fell into a manhole at a work site in Chetlap Kok. Back in 2017, three workers died of possible drowning and gas inhalation at an underground site. The contractor was slapped with an $11,000 fine. Sharon Tang, TVB News. 
four metal gates fell at the Kaitak cruise terminal, injuring a male security officer. The gates, each measuring two meters by four meters, were cordoned off as authorities began their investigation. Officers received a report at around 11.30 a.m. today saying four metal gates fell suddenly. A 51-year-old security guard was wounded. The man, half-conscious, was taken to Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Officers believe he and his colleagues were trying to move the gates at the time. The case has been classified as an industrial accident. The Consumer Council said it is unaware of the number of people affected by last week's cyber attack. The hackers demanded a ransom, which the council promptly rejected. Jilly Wong, chief executive of the council, said she was unsure of the exact number of people impacted in the hacker attack. The council has delivered emails to more than 20,000 individuals who were potentially affected. Meanwhile, some residents said they had received scam calls claiming to be from the Consumer Council. The Consumer Watchdog clarified on Monday those calls were not made by their staff or system. The Council urged the public to refrain from submitting any personal information when receiving suspicious calls, messages or emails. Washington says U.S. President Joe Biden will host a second summit of Pacific Island leaders this week. About a year after the inaugural summit, the meeting is part of a U.S. charm offensive to counter China's growing influence in the region. During the three-day meeting, Biden will announce diplomatic recognition for two Pacific islands, Cook Islands and Niue, and promise new funding for infrastructure, including undersea internet cables to improve connectivity. At last year's meeting involving 14 countries, Biden pledged to strengthen their partnerships in a region where democracy will be able to flourish. A notable absentee is Solomon Islands leader Manasse Sagoravare, who visited President Xi Jinping in China in July, reaching an understanding to achieve development through Beijing policies. Britain put its army on standby on Sunday, this after a number of London police officers handed in their weapons in support of a fellow officer who has been charged with murder over the fatal shooting of an unarmed black man. British police are not routinely armed. Only about 10 percent of London's police officers carry firearms and the ones that do undergo special training. The BBC says around 100 metropolitan police officers have stepped back from firearms duties. This follows the court appearance last week of an officer who has been charged over the death of 24-year-old Chris Kaba on September 2022. The officer was not named. He was granted bail and is expected to stand trial next year. Kaba died hours after his car was stopped by police and he was then hit by a single bullet. The case renewed allegations of institutional racism within the Met Police. Police units in armored vehicles have descended on the village of Banshka in northern Kosovo to secure and search the area a day after four people were killed there during a shootout between officers and ethnic Serb gunmen. The attack comes amid soaring tensions in northern Kosovo, where Serbs have long demanded the implementation of an EU broker deal to create an association of autonomous municipalities. Daniel Rao tells us more. Kosovo Prime Minister Albin Kurti said at least 30 assailants opened fire on a police patrol at about 3 a.m. local time in the village of Banska. The shooters killed a Kosovo Albanian police officer and stormed a Serbian Orthodox monastery. This set off gun battles that also left three assailants dead and two other police officers injured. The police retook the monastery late on Sunday. Authorities arrested six gunmen, two of whom were injured. The police said they had found an extraordinarily large amount of weaponry, ammunition and explosives. Armed police units continuing to search houses in the village looking for any gunmen who had not fled. Kosovo declared Monday a day of mourning after the police officer was killed as Prime Minister Kurti claimed the attack was supported by Serbia. 
Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic denied the allegations. Instead, he blamed Kurti for inciting violence by refusing to form an association of Serbian municipalities to give them more autonomy and by launching frequent police actions in northern Kosovo. Serbia and its former province Kosovo have been at odds for decades. Their 1998-99 war left more than 10,000 people dead. Kosovo unilaterally declared independence in 2008. Belgrade has refused to recognize the move. Thousands are fleeing Nagorno-Karabakh with Azerbaijan in control of the enclave, where most of the residents are ethnic Armenian. A military offensive last week, which Baku called an anti-terrorist operation, has left many in fear, with hundreds packing up and heading for the border with Armenia. Each country is blaming the other as a refugee crisis develops. David Garrett has more. The displaced have found somewhere for now. These ethnic Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh no longer feel safe in the place they call home. Young and old gather at the border with Armenia as they leave Azerbaijan. They took whatever possessions they could for the 150-kilometre journey. The roads around the makeshift camp are clogged with more arriving. A ceasefire is in place, but these refugees fear violence will flare up again. Nagorno-Karabakh had been under the control of ethnic Armenians for three decades, but the area is internationally recognized as Azerbaijan territory. Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan said Azerbaijan and Russian peacekeepers bear responsibility for the exodus, saying those fleeing fear repercussions and he believes they face ethnic cleansing. Both countries criticized the other at the United Nations over the weekend. Armenia mobilized all available resources for a manipulation campaign based on fabricated allegations of blockade, humanitarian crisis or ethnic cleansing. For this purpose, Armenia recklessly politicized and essentially abstracted the delivery of goods to the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan for its agenda of separatism and blocked consistent efforts of several international actors to find a legitimate and practical solutions through dialogue. 30% of the population of Nagorno-Karabakh is displaced. The entire population of Nagorno-Karabakh remains without any means of subsistence as just limited humanitarian assistance has been able to enter into Nagorno-Karabakh. There is no food, no medicine, no shelter, no place to go. Turkey is a major power in the region bordering Armenia. It supported the Azerbaijan attack. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan is meeting with his Azerbaijani counterpart Ilham Aliyev. The South Caucasus region is a mix of ethnicities crisscrossed with oil and gas pipelines, with Turkey jostling for influence alongside Russia, the United States and Iran. David Garrett, TVB News. Still ahead, in Florida, an alligator killed after it was found with human remains in its mouth. In the U.S. state of Florida, an alligator was killed after it was found with the remains of a woman in its jaws. Police were alerted on Friday by a witness. The sheriff's office began a hunt for the alligator in and around Largo Canal on the west coast of Florida near the Gulf of Mexico. Aerial footage shows police capturing the creature, which measured more than four meters in length, much larger than usual. They secured it to the back of the truck and later killed it. The woman was identified as 41-year-old Sabrina Peckham. She had been camping and apparently went for a walk at night when the alligator came out of the water and attacked her. The government will roll out its chronic disease co-care pilot scheme in November. Those who are eligible will be subsidized to undergo screening for diabetes or hypertension by a family doctor of their choice. All Hong Kong residents aged 45 or above with no known medical history of diabetes or hypertension are eligible to join the scheme. During the screening phase, the government will offer subsidies to cover laboratory investigation fees in full and the consultation fee of $196. Participants will only need to pay a designated fee of $120. Those diagnosed with diabetes or hypertension are entitled to a maximum of six subsidized consultation visits per year. For the treatment phase, a consultation fee of $166 will be subsidized by the government for each visit. 
The veterinary medicine program at City University of Hong Kong has been accredited by two international bodies. The program has been accredited by the Australasian Veterinary Boards Council and the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons in the UK. As such, the local veterinary surgeon board has included the program as a recognized qualification. This means graduated students can register as veterinarians in Hong Kong. The veterinary surgeon board said it will soon process applications and announce results in October. That's the news. Pearl Magazine is up shortly. Bye for now.